Good evening. Today we will continue our study in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be looking at chapter 11, and this chapter is really a great chapter because what it does is help these New Testament Christians and us as well to see how even when your faith is tested, that you can remain faithful to God. And so this chapter is about all those heroes and heroines of faith of the Old Testament. Through chapter 10, the writers presented the evidence as to how and why Jesus Christ is superior to all who came before him. He's superior to the angels, superior to Moses, superior to the priesthood of Israel, the high priest of Aaron's order. He brings in a superior covenant based upon better promises, and he has offered the superior perfect sacrifice, the sacrifice of himself. The last part of chapter 10 is an exhortation to Christians to hold on to Christ and the blessings only he can bring into their lives. As a Christian's high priest, we can now enter into the presence of God with boldness and confidence because he's gone before us and will stand with us. Now we're in chapter 11, and this chapter is evidence that faithfulness to God will result in rich blessings now and in eternity. We sometimes call Hebrews 11 God's honor roll of faith. Some 40 individuals are either named or referenced to illustrate what true faith really is. It's just not just believing in God or believing in something. It is a commitment to. And so these men and these women were well known to these Jewish Christians in the first century. You see, they were their ancestors in the Jewish family. The purpose of bringing them into the discussion is to show that struggling in the faith was not something new to the first century church. And it's certainly not anything new to us here in the 21st century. And so it has, it has been the history of God's people since the beginning to have a struggle with their faith. It's never been easy to be a faithful child of God. It's not easy today. In fact, it's probably harder today than it's ever been. At least 18 times, uh, the words by faith are found in this chapter to show what true faith really is. The bottom line is, if they could do it, you can do it too. And that's what these first century Christians needed to hear. We need to hear, it, hear that too. If they can do it, we can do it. If they can be faithful in their struggles, we can be faithful in our struggles as well. So we're going to study chapter 11, but we're going to do it in sections. We're going to divide it into three parts. Today, we're going to go in verses 1 through 5, because quite, quite a bit that's included in these verses that I want to include in this study. And then we will do the second part uh, next week, and then the following week, we'll finish it up. Now, obviously, it would take several weeks to go back and study in detail all of these characters, because there's an awful lot to their stories. Some of them we will go into more detail than we will with others. Some we will just simply reference their name or their circumstances. But would you begin with me uh, before we read these verses with a word of prayer? Holy Father, we thank you that you are our God and we are your children. We thank you for this time of studying this great book of Hebrews, especially this great chapter 11 that shows us very clearly how faithfulness to you, commitment to you, is what you want and how you will bless us when we do. Now bless our study today and all our efforts to serve you and forgive us when we fail. We pray through Jesus. Amen. I want you to read with me these first five verses of chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he 
pleased God. Now, these are the verses that we are going to discuss for our time together today. In verse 1, some have taken this to make a firm or formal definition of faith, leaving open the idea that faith has no substantial basis. Believe whatever you want. So substance indicates the ground upon which faith stands. In Romans 10 and verse 17, Paul wrote there, by, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The ground upon which our faith stands is the word of God. Things hoped for is an anticipation of receiving what has been promised. Hope is more than a dream or a wish. We all dream of wonderful things at times. We even wish for those things to come true. In reality, we have no basis for our hope. The things Christians hope for are the things that have been revealed in the Word of God. The blessings of living the Christian life on earth and the blessings in heaven when this life is over. Evidence is the proof or the facts to support what is believed and what is hoped for. What evidence do we have? Since the beginning of time, God has presented evidence to support his promises. The world he created and all the intricate forms of life. For example, Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And in Psalm 19, I love this psalm, verses 1 and 2 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is evidence for things we cannot see all around us. For example, evidence that the wind is blowing. We can feel it. We can see the tree sway. We can see what it does, like when a, a storm comes. But we can't see the wind. It's invisible. Evidence that we have electricity. We can see what it does and all kinds of things that we use that needs its power. We can even feel it if we dare. I wouldn't do it if I were you. But we can't see it. Now, while we can't see God and all the ways he does his work, we can see the results of what he does and the work that he has done. And that is the evidence that we need to know that he is real and that his promises will be kept. Verse 2, therein is how this verse begins. Therein, or for by it, therein means in faith. You see, the elders are those whose names and manner of life follow in this chapter. The good testimony of their lives is verified in the Word of God. The Scriptures verify and witness to the struggles they faced, the way that they lived, and the trust that they placed in God. Their stories can be found in the pages of the Old Testament. But before proceeding with the discussion of those individuals, the writer goes back to the very beginning. He goes back to the story of creation, a story of faith. Verse 3, in Genesis 1, we find nine times when things came into existence or some action was initiated when God said. The worlds, as is used here, plural, means all the cosmic universe and all the planets, the stars, the moons, the meteorites, and all those uh, beings, planets, and things that are out there in space, all came into existence by the spoken word of God. In other words, God created the universe from nothing. Well, I know someone will say, how can you create something from nothing? That's a good question. The answer is that God, who is eternal, and all-powerful is the source of the something from which all things were created. Scientifically, five elements are needed for anything to exist. That is time, force, energy, space, and matter. Now, take a look at the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, 
there you have time. God, there you have force. Created, there you have energy. The heavens, there you have space. And the earth, there you have matter. All of the things that are necessary for anything to exist, time, force, energy, space, and matter are found right there in Genesis 1 and verse 1. Now, included in verse 3 of Hebrews 11 is the worlds were framed. That's an interesting phrase. The worlds were framed. To frame means to produce or to place all the parts of a body or a machine in their right order. The universe is an orderly cosmic design. When you read the creation story in Genesis 1, you not only see orderly design, you also see order in what was created when. For example, the very first form of creation was a formless void of space and matter, the heavens and the earth with a covering of water over the earth. On day one, it is reported that God created light. Life cannot exist without light. So that had to be one of the very first things that was created. On day two, God created the atmosphere with water above from the water on the earth. We understand that there is a firmament, water above in our atmosphere, plus that water which is upon the face of the earth. On day three, God separated the water from the dry land, that is the water that was on the earth. He separated the water from the dry land and brought forth plant life. Plant life needed water, needed light, needed air, and needed earth in order to exist. And so you see, you begin to see a, an orderly creation. On day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. The sun was needed to produce photosynthesis, needed by plants to separate carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. However, nighttime was also needed to keep the earth from becoming too hot. He also created seasons so that the life cycle could complete itself in a yearly cycle. So you again, you see that there is an order, a logical order in the way that things were created and when they were created. Everything created needed something that was created either the day or a few days ahead of it. On day five, God created the sea creatures, fish and the birds. Obviously, they needed the water. They needed the air. They needed all of these things. They needed the, the plant life that was on the earth in order to exist. And then on day six, God created land creatures, such as the cattle and all the creeping things. All of those needed what was created in the days before. They needed the water. They needed the land. They needed the plants. They needed the, the, the sun. They needed everything that was produced in the days ahead. Then, on day six, God also created his crowning achievement. He created mankind. But he did more than just create mankind on that day. He created mankind in his image and in his likeness. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Genesis 2 and verse 7. So we begin to see this orderly phase of creation that went through those those first six days of the existence of this world. Everything God created was in some way dependent on the preceding days. And mankind needed them all, every single one of them, in order to survive. And those were each a 24-hour day. Now, I want you to think about that. If you think these were were millenniums of time, millions of years that went by from one day to the next day to the next day. How else could plants be pollinated if they did not have the insects and bees and others to pollinate them to keep them producing from year to year? This, these were 24-hour days of creation, six of them. And as you know, God rested on the seventh day. It became the Sabbath. A rest is what that word means. The thing we need to remember and the evidence is right before our very eyes is that we live in an ordered universe. Everywhere you look, look up, look across, even look down 
as far into the earth as you can look and you see an orderly universe and orderly creation. All parts are in their proper place. Everything is held in place by design. Even more evidence of a designer is how intricate uh, life is in every way. Every form of life, from plants to animals to human, has its own unique design, its own DNA, if you will. Psalm 33 and verse 6 says this, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And in verse 9 of Psalm 33, it says, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Truly, the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, God created this world and this universe from absolutely nothing. Only his word brought it into existence. Verse 4. Now we start looking at individuals. And this one starts off by faith, Abel. Now have you noticed that there is a glaring omission of the father and mother of the human race. Not a word about Adam or Eve. It is no accident that the writer omits their names completely in this hall of faith. Why? Why, why did the writer choose to name Abraham and Sarah and not Adam and Eve? Why were they not mentioned in verse 3 in connection with the created world? Because that was the crowning event of creation. God created Adam and then from her, he created Eve, but not a word about either one of them. You have to wonder, could it be that there's no good report about them? Scripture only mentions them in other places as bringing sin into the world and the suffering that Eve brought upon women in childbirth. Nothing is told about their repentance. Nothing is told about their faith. Nothing is told about their holiness. Nothing is told about their commitment to God once they left the Garden of Eden. We can only guess at the reasons why they are not included in this chapter. They didn't deserve to be included. That's the only reason I can give. Now back to Abel. Abel was the second son of Adam and Eve. He offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain, his older brother, the first son born to Adam and Eve. And he offered it by faith. He offered his sacrifice by faith. Remember, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's no doubt that both Cain and Abel were told by God the kind of sacrifice that they were to offer. Abel did, Cain did not. Surely Abel offered the blood sacrifice of his animal while Cain offered the sacrifice of the fruit and the grain only. It appears as though God expected some of both, in particular the blood sacrifice, which he's always required as an atonement for sin. Abel then became witnessed that he is or was righteous. And now, even being dead, still testifies as to what God wants. There's a lesson here for all who would offer their worship to God. If we do it his way, he will accept us. If we don't do it his way, he will not accept us. We need to remember that. God's, the worship of God should be his way, not ours. Verse five, by faith, Enoch. Enoch was the great grandfather of Noah. His son was Methuselah, that man who lived to be 969 years of age. And you can calculate out that he died the year of the flood. Doesn't mean that he died in the flood. He just died the year of the flood. That's Methuselah. His son was Lemek, Genesis 5, 21 through 27. And so we begin to see something of a, of a lineage here. In the Genesis account of Enoch, all we have recorded is Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. That's in Genesis 5 and verse 24. Now, if that's all we had recorded for us about Enoch, we would not know everything we need to know about him, but we know it here. At least we know a whole lot more here from Hebrews chapter 11. It's kind of like the information on Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. 
Hebrews, the book of Hebrews sheds more light on his walk, Enoch's walk with God. So here we see clearly Enoch did not die. He didn't go through the process of death that, that most people will. God took him directly from this life. Only one other person had such an experience. His name was Elijah. Elijah was taken in a chariot of fire by a whirlwind into heaven. You can read about that in 2 Kings 2, verse 11. Neither the body of Enoch or Elijah were ever found. The word translated is found in some translations, uh, uh, meaning that they both made the change from mortal life to immortal life so as to be suited for heaven. And you can read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58, where, where the Apostle Paul goes through a, a very clear scenario of we may not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for all will be changed. The mortal must put on immortality. The corrupt must put on incorruption in order to be suited for eternal life. Now, when you combine the passages in Genesis 5, with what we're seeing right here in Hebrews 11, we know that Enoch was a godly man. He walked with God. He pleased God. He, he was a great example of faith for us to follow because someday we too will be translated. That is translated out of this life, prepared for the next. Our temporal bodies will be resurrected and changed into an immortal body suited for eternity. A word of warning, not everyone will be translated into heaven. Yes, we will change, and we will be suited for eternal life. Something you need to think about. I think sometimes people think that a devil's hell is a consuming fire. It'll just literally burn up and consume, and there won't be, any, won't be anything left. Once our body is changed for eternal life, a spiritual life, it can live and live and live and live and live and live forever in either torment or in heaven. We need to remember that. We'll continue our study of Hebrews 11 next week. And as you can see, there's much to be learned from this great chapter about these Old Testament characters and how they lived by faith. Hebrews 11 is not just about faith. That is a belief in something or someone. A lot of people have that. The devils believe in, believe in tremble, James tells us in James 2. It's about walking by faith, as we see right here in talking about Enoch. It's about faithfulness to God and his word. As James wrote in James 2, verse 19, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. We'll continue next week in our study of Hebrews 11. Let us pray. Holy Father, we, we thank you for this time that we've had to study, to look at these, these first verses of chapter 11 that helps us to see what, what true faith is, that it is faithfulness as much as it is a belief in. Help us to be faithful to you as these of old were. Thank you for Jesus. We pray it all in his name. Amen.